So good to be with you all tonight. And Raquel, welcome with your two sons. Good to have you all. Some folks from Mountain View Gospel Church many, many years ago. Let's see, I was there from, what was that, 1976 to 1990, I believe it was. Wow, that's a long time ago, folks. <laughs> Glad you're with us. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. Tonight we are looking at hard cases. No, that was last week. <laughs> and nobody even shook their head. Were you listening last week? <laughs> Tonight it's politics and problems. Acts chapter 25, verses 22 through 27. Last week we did look at hard cases make bad law. The Apostle Paul is standing on trial. Very interesting as we look at the way that it's being handled. Handled by pagans as Jews are accusing the Apostle Paul. And on the most interesting of subjects, they want the death penalty for Paul on a subject that the Romans scratch their head and think, why did they bother coming to court? I'm going to start reading in verse 13, although tonight we're actually going to go all the way down to verse 27, and our real text is verses 22 and following, but it, it gives to us a background that we need for our study tonight. Acts chapter 25, beginning in verse 13. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, there is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him. To whom I answered, It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. And by the way, a lot of things from Roman law have come over into American law now. Therefore, when they were come hither, without any delay, on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. Against whom, when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusations of such things as I supposed, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition, and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved under the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Gracious Father, again we pray for your blessing on our study tonight that you might guide and direct by your spirit, that you might give us insight and understanding, but more importantly, not merely that we would understand it in our head, but that we will be able to apply the things that we learn, become more faithful and bolder in our witness for Christ, and, Father, be always unashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so, Father, we pray for your blessing on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please, and that it would prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we noted last week, the heart of this trial is the issue of the resurrection. The resurrection. And you know, that is always the heart of the matter with any human rationalist. He must not believe it or his house of cards collapses. It's the nut that the pagan evolutionists cannot swallow. It's the roadblock that the materialists cannot get around. It looms like an impending avalanche that is going to engulf the unbelieving climber on the mountainside. It is the key issue and the heart of Christianity, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Without the resurrection, we have no hope. Without the resurrection, everything that we do in terms of church is absolutely useless and worthless. The resurrection stands out in all of human history as unique. The resurrection of Christ. Satan has placed blinders on unbelievers on that critical issue because the resurrection of Christ is the heart of the gospel. We find that in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God 
which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, there's the humanity of Christ, the prophetic humanity of Christ, a descendant of King David, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. That's the proof of the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. The true humanity, the sinless humanity, and the absolute unmitigated deity of Christ. He is the God-man. If he is not man, he cannot die for your sins. If he is not God, he cannot save you from your sins. He must be both God and man. He must die to pay the penalty. He must rise from the dead for our justification according to Scripture. Paul writes that same key issue over in 1 Corinthians 15. Beginning in verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. So he's talking about the gospel, the good news. What is the gospel? By which also you are saved. We'd better know what this is, because this is the key to our salvation. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. And he's going to tell you, if these things are not true, you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Did you notice, both in Romans and also here in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul bases as his final and ultimate authority everything he's teaching on the Scriptures. This is what is prophesied. This is what is fulfilled. This is the reason for our hope. We have the Word of God on this subject. That he died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The resurrection is the sine qua non of the Christian faith. Everyone dies, so how would we know that Jesus' death paid for our sins? It is by the resurrection of Christ from the dead. As we've noted before, even the most hard-hearted, unbelieving, God-hating pagan will not resist when you tell him that Christ died. Because he'll gladly accept that. Everybody faces death. Death is the end result of all humanity. He'll begin to argue with you when you tell him that Christ died for his sins because he doesn't believe that he has any sins. And he doesn't believe that sin actually exists. He just sort of makes mistakes. And he certainly doesn't believe that he himself is a sinner. But when you tell him that Christ rose from the dead as proof that he died for our sins and that the sacrifice of Jesus was accepted by God the Father as the basis for our salvation, just like we see in our text tonight, the pagan God-haters turn red in the face, jump up and down, scream blasphemies at you, and they do not want to hear it because it puts them on the spot. It means there is a God to whom they someday will be accountable. The resurrection of Christ is something that the natural man will not and cannot accept because it destroys the very foundation of his miserable life. And just as an aside, when you witness, you do witness, don't you? I trust you do. You do share Christ with people around you, do you? It is your calling. It is your privilege to have good news that rescues men and women, boys and girls, from the lake of fire? Do you care about them? Does it not trouble you that someone you know may be on their way to hell? I hope it does. If you saw them, that friend of yours, in an automobile wreck and the flames were beginning to lick out from under the hood and they were caught in their seatbelt and they were screaming for help, would you come and rescue them? I think you would. Do you not care about their eternal soul? Or are you too embarrassed, too ashamed of Jesus? I hope not. You see, that's why you must always emphasize the resurrection of Christ when you're presenting the gospel. 
Because only the Christ of Scripture, the risen Christ, can save us from our sins. A dead Christ cannot save anybody. We mentioned last week that there are places in the world where the churches are allowed to preach about the death of Christ, but they are absolutely forbidden to preach about the resurrection. Why? Because the resurrection not only gives life, but it gives hope for the future. There are practical implications in terms of population control why some governments will not let you preach the resurrection of Christ. Because, you see, if people have hope for the future, they are less likely to be docile and easily controlled by the authorities. Sadly, even here in America, a lot of Christians have given up hope in light of our current political choices that seem to be available in the upcoming election. But we never have to give up hope because we serve a risen Christ who is coming again. And he's coming to judge the world. He's the one that we serve. Here we see in our passage that the Jewish leaders rightly perceived that the doctrine of the resurrection was causing them to lose their grip of control over the people. That's why they're so insistent that the Apostle Paul be put to death. That was why they wanted to make sure that the message of Christianity did not spread any further than it had gone. Because they understood that the resurrection would change the hearts of men that they would no longer be bound by the legalisms and the Pharisaisms and all the, the money that was pouring into the temple. They had control over the people, much like Rome has control over millions of people around the world today, claiming to be the only source of dispensing salvation, and you must give to the church to be able to be saved and go to heaven after you've been through purgatory and a, a few unpleasant things there. And even the popes have to be prayed out of purgatory. If the pope has to be prayed out of purgatory, what chance does the average man stand of getting out? Yes, religionists hate the doctrine of the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. We find that they had started as soon as the resurrection took place, trying to deny it back in Matthew chapter 27. Now the next day that followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together into Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Now isn't that amazing? Jesus rises from the dead. The Pharisees get word of it because the guards run and tell them. The guards saw it happen. The Pharisees knew the guards weren't lying, but they actually believed it before it happened. They wanted the tomb sealed before it happened. They understood better than the disciples did that Jesus had prophesied he would rise from the dead. That's why they sealed the tomb. And the resurrection takes place. And do the disciples believe it? No. The women saw the angels. Peter and John ran to the tomb and found it empty. But then they hid out for fear of the Jews. Until Jesus appeared to them. The resurrection is life-changing. The resurrection is earth-shattering. The resurrection is the most powerful event in all of history, and the Jewish leaders knew that. They tried to make the sepulcher sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, You have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. <laughs> and then we asked a very interesting question. How many of us would have been like the soldiers after the resurrection? 
Chapter 28, a few verses later, it says, Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ear, we will persuade him and secure you. We got a lot of money. And we know what motivates politicians, don't we? <laughs> Same thing true today, a lot of money. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. You know, we heard that when we lived in Israel and we're 2,000 years down the road from when the resurrection took place. I lived there for a year. I had many opportunities to talk to Jews. And that saying is still reported commonly until this day. The swoon theory it's called today. Jesus didn't really die. He just swooned. And then afterwards he came out of the tomb and they pretended it was a resurrection. You stop and think about it. Someone who has been beaten until his raw muscle tissue shows through his ripped flesh. Someone who has hung for hours on a cross where normally the criminals would die of asphyxiation when they got so weak that they couldn't pull themselves up to take their next breath. Nails driven through his hands and feet. A spear piercing not just his side, but John says blood and water came out. That means the pericardial sac around the heart was pierced by the spear. A spear wound to the heart. Left alone with no medical attention for three days in a cold tomb with a stone weighing several tons in front of the door. And then managing to shove it out of the way without waking guards up. <laughs> it takes a lot more to believe that than it does to believe that Jesus, God the Son, rose from the dead like the scriptures prophesied. And then we ask the question, how much money would you take? How much money would you take to deny the resurrection? Have you ever fantasized? Have you ever dreamed about having a lot of money? Now, I know that you all are really spiritual, and you've probably never done this, but just imagine if you had ever dreamed of winning the New Jersey lottery. <laughs> you've never done that, right? Of course not. Or ever dreamed of winning those Powerball things or, you know, Publishers Clearinghouse. Every now and then you see those advertisements where you get so many millions of dollars and then hundreds of thousands of dollars every year for the rest of your life. And your mind drifted into it. The human heart is covetous, isn't it? It says they gave them large money. They wanted to make sure that this story got around. You say, well, you know, I can still believe in the resurrection in my heart, and I sure would like to be rich, and I could donate a lot to the church. Would you deny the resurrection if you had seen Jesus come out of the tomb? These men obviously didn't believe. They didn't trust Christ. They weren't saved. Money was more important to them. They risked their lives for money. The Apostle Paul in our text tonight is risking his life for the resurrected Christ. There's a difference in motivation, isn't there? Because the resurrection of Christ gives hope for the future, it's closely tied to the literal bodily return of Christ at the rapture and then at the second coming. And that's why the rapture is called the blessed hope. The believer has hope. 
For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, where did we hear about salvation coming from? We saw it in the passages dealing with the resurrection of Christ and the gospel. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. And you know what? It changes your life. Look at verse 12, Titus chapter 2. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. It changes your life. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that's his death, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. It changes your life. What you believe shows up in the way that you live. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. You know, in those same places around the world where the resurrection of Christ is forbidden to be spoken about, so is the return of Christ. You see, hope makes people unafraid to share the gospel because they know the best is yet to come. That's why the doctrine of the resurrection and the return of Christ is such a fearful thing to pagans who have an insatiable desire to control people. They must keep them always believing that there is no hope. A man without hope will not jeopardize his life. A man without hope will do what he is told to do and not rock the boat. He won't buck the political authorities. A man without hope thinks only of his own temporal, miserable existence. But a man with hope is willing to stand up and be counted. He's willing to die so that others might live. He's willing to speak boldly to and against those who would oppose and oppress others. The gospel with its core doctrine of the resurrection gives hope. And that's why we see the Apostle Paul standing here tonight unashamed to speak before rulers of the only hope that there is. But it's also easy enough to see in our text why the Jewish leaders were so rabidly and so desperately trying to get the Romans to kill Paul, or at the very least, put Paul in a situation where they could assassinate him. They said, you know, bring him back to Jerusalem. And so, you know... Felix and Festus, I mean, they said, hey, do you want to go up to Jerusalem? We'll hold the trial there. Change of venue will not make any difference, except it gives opportunity along the way for the assassins to bump him off. You see, Paul preached the resurrection, and that was threatening their control of the people at the temple. The second thing that we notice here as we look at this passage tonight is that pagan leaders are trying to solve a spiritual problem. You know, isn't it interesting? We have all these world leaders today trying to solve all kinds of problems all over the world, and things only seem to get worse. Have you noticed that no matter what they try, it doesn't work? You think of all the different political situations that are going on trying to solve problems with ISIS and Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. All the solutions that are trying to be used to solve the problems that are going on in South America, you know, where various presidents of different countries have been found to be embezzling money and cheating on money, and uh, the drug lords which are being captured here in the United States, then escaping and uh, then being caught again and put back into less secure prisons. I mean, do you follow anything that's going on in the news? And nothing seems to work. Because the real issue is not a political problem. The real issue is not financial problems. The real issue is a spiritual problem. And until the spiritual problem is addressed, you do not have solutions that work. Now the scripture prophesies that the world will continue to get worse and worse and worse and worse until God takes the believers out and then it'll really get bad. And then there will be the rise of the Antichrist. Do you have any concept of what is going on in the United States whereby now our president is pushing diligently to try to make sure that 
transgendered people are not discriminated against. So let me get this straight. It's wrong to discriminate against a boy who thinks he's a girl, but it's okay to discriminate against a girl who thinks she's a girl. Put the boys in the girls' bathrooms. You're discriminating against the girls, but that's okay because here's a guy who thinks he's a girl and he wants to go and take a shower with the girls. Get a life, people. Our president is pushing for that. The federal government is suing the states that have said we will not do it. We would rather give up federal funds. Has our country gone mad? Yes. Because the solutions of reason, which are based on faulty logic and on human depravity, will always come to the wrong conclusions. But if you start with the word of God, if you start with the foundation of scripture, if you start with the death of Christ for our sins, proven by the resurrection, you suddenly have a whole new field of play. Our country has for years since the 1960s been rejecting the word of God taking the Ten Commandments down, taking Bible out of the school, taking prayer out of the school. Although they can never really take prayer out of school because there will always be tests and the students will always be praying they can pass. Dear people, I love this country. And I witness when I have opportunity to those who are lost. I had the privilege this past week was spending over an hour with a young man, a Jewish young man, who was working on our property here, sharing Christ with him, that it's his Messiah. And he was open, pray for him. His name is Jeff. He's heard the gospel. I gave him one of our Gospel of John's over here. He said he'd read it. I gave him a tract explaining simply the plan of salvation. I gave him the DVD produced by my brother about how Christians rescued Jews in Holland in World War II. He said he'd watch it. Do you care? I wept as I spoke with that young man. Because God cares. Are you busy about giving hope to people who have no hope? I hope you are. So here we have pagan leaders trying to solve a spiritual problem, which of course is impossible. Agrippa and Bernice have come to Caesarea. They're going to greet Festus on his appointment as proconsul there in Caesarea. And that brings us down to verse 22. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing, with the chief captains and the principal men of the city, at Festus' commandment, Paul was brought forth. So they made a big deal out of this. I mean, like, this is really unique. Who's ever had a trial like this in a Roman court? Festus was scratching his head. He'd never heard about anything like this in law school. And, you know, here he's got Agrippa, and Agrippa is, as we find out in the text, is a very, very skilled man in Jewish law. So we got two of the bright, brilliant, genius minds, the legal minds, they are going to try to unravel this case. We have a big deal going on. It says he came with great pomp and was entered into the place of hearing. They had all the bigwigs there. The chief captains were there. The principal men of the city. You know, most of the time when we think about this trial that's going on, we think of, okay, so here's Festus and here's Agrippa. And Bernice is over there on the sides, you know, polishing her nails. No, not so. This was a big deal. All the principal men of the city. Everybody wanted to hear this. Agrippa was in town. Agrippa understood what's going on with the Jews. Festus may be new, but he's good in Roman law. Let's hear how they solve this problem. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us, 
Ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. You think they might have been a little bit upset. Yeah, they were. Paul preached the resurrection. When people understand the implications of the resurrection, and that if Jesus died for their sins and rose again, and that they, someday they will stand before him, they do not want to hear that. Men do not want to be held accountable. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, I mean, I looked all the way through the Roman Code, you know, that 47 volumes there, that, man, I, I sat up late at night, and I was looking through it, and, man, I couldn't find anything about, you must kill people who believe in the resurrection. It's not in our Roman law. And that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I determined to send him. Of whom, <laughs> but I got a problem. Maybe you guys can help me. Because I don't want to look like an idiot. I mean, when he gets to Caesar, what are we going to say? And he's a Roman citizen. He has the right to appeal to Caesar. And so it's going to come before Caesar. And Caesar says, what are those hicks out there in Judea doing anyway, sending a guy like this to me and wasting my time? of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord, wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and specially before thee, O King Agrippa, I'm passing the buck here, whether you know it or not, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. And here's probably the biggest understatement in the entire New Testament. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. <laughs> You're right. Well, in that section of the text, Festus admits that he has no way to solve the problem because he has nothing to write to Caesar that will stick as a crime and this will make him look like an idiot and not worthy to be an officer under Roman law. I mean, he's looking out for his own job security here. Now, I think there are several things that stand out immediately to us in the text. First of these, the pagans are trying to deal with the spiritual matter. We mentioned that one already. They're trying to handle a case that rests on the resurrection of Christ. But, and some of you know a little bit about law, this would be a bizarre kind of a case to bring in any American court. Because they're trying to handle a case that's based on the resurrection, but they're not actually going to try the issue, nor are they going to look at the evidence surrounding the issue. Can you imagine going into court and you've got a criminal case in front of you concerning drugs and murder. And so you come into court and they start listening to stuff that deals with shoplifting and running red lights. Wouldn't you scratch your head and say, this is not what this case is about. But that's exactly what's going on here. They're not actually going to try the issue or the evidence for the issue because rising from the dead and asserting that someone has risen from the dead, there are at least five things that can't fit their court system. Number one, it's not a criminal offense. Number two, it is not a repeatable event for the sake of proof in court. In other words, we'd say it's not subject to scientific investigation or to the scientific method. The scientific method requires things to be repeatable. Third, from a humanistic perspective, the issue is a non-issue. Everybody dies. So like where all these resurrected people around here that we're supposed to see coming up? No. It's a non-issue as far as they're concerned. Number four, there is, if there is no evidence to convict Paul, even if rising from the dead or preaching about it was a criminal offense. Because Jesus has already gone back to heaven. And fifth, to the contrary, Paul claims eyewitness testimony to support his claim, including his own eyewitness account on the Damascus Road. Paul tells us there are over 500 people who are still alive when he wrote 1 Corinthians 15 who witnessed the resurrected Christ. You know, that's a lot more evidence than the Jews who simply said somebody came and stole his body by night. You've got eyewitness testimony. The second thing that stands out, and this becomes more evident as we move further into the text, is that Agrippa is an expert in Jewish law, an expert in Jewish customs, and an expert in the evidence that's required under Jewish law. You know, when God gave the law to Moses in the Old Testament, 
he required specific testimony and evidence for any time a criminal offense took place. First of all, the charge they're bringing is not a criminal offense, even for the Jews. But they do not have the evidence they need. They tried it with Jesus. You remember, many false witnesses were brought. You remember the trial of our Lord. Many false witnesses were brought, and they didn't agree with each other. The witnesses had to agree. All we have with the Jews coming before the Romans here is they're not very happy with Paul. They just want to see him killed. No witnesses to anything. No evidence for anything. Festus may be new to the job, but with Agrippa, he, there is every reason to think that he understood the far-reaching implications of what Paul was teaching and preaching. Agrippa, in fact, had married a Jewess. Her name was Bernice. She was no slouch. We learn something about her as we read history. Bernice was apparently a very beautiful and a very seductive woman and had multiple historians record the many men to whom she was married and with whom she had affairs. She was the eldest daughter of Agrippa I by his wife, Cyprus. She was a spouse to Marcus, the son of Alexander, and upon his death, she married her own uncle, Herod, king of Chalcis. She bore him two sons. After the death of Herod Chalcis, she lived in incest with her own brother, Agrippa II, the Agrippa of our text. She then married Tolman, king of Cilicia, but soon deserted him and returned to Agrippa II. It was at that point that she visited Festus with him on his appointment as procurator of Judea. But she didn't stop there. Not satisfied with her incestuous relationship with her brother, she afterward became the mistress of Vespasian. And when that was not enough, she also became the mistress to his son Titus. She was a grossly wicked and immoral woman. Now stop and think about this. She heard Paul preach. Paul was no slouch theologian. Paul knew with precision the gospel and had seen the resurrected Christ on the road to Damascus. She understood politics. She moved in those circles. She understood power. She moved in those circles. She understood men. She moved in those circles. She heard Paul with her own ears. But you see, a sinner, without the moving of the Holy Spirit, will not admit he's a sinner. Nor will he admit that he needs a Savior. Or in this case, she admit that she needs a Savior. It's not all we know about her. No indication she ever came to Christ, even though she heard the truth from the mouth of the Apostle Paul himself. But there's one more fascinating fact about her in history, and that is that Bernice and her son were killed a few short years later in the eruption of Vesuvius on August 24, 79 AD, when they were buried under more than six feet of ashes at Pompeii, which was so heavy it caused the roofs of all the houses to collapse. Vesuvius, which rises above the Bay of Naples on the eastern shore in southern Italy, is about eight miles southeast of Naples. It has erupted 50 times. The most recent eruption was in 1944. Pliny the Younger preserved an excellent account of the catastrophe in his two letters to the historian Tacitus. He was staying at Misenum, west of Naples, where his uncle Pliny the Elder was admiral commanding the naval station there. The elder Pliny set out by boat to rescue survivors at Herculaneum, but he arrived too late. He went to Sabai, where he spent the night observing the eruption and then died the following morning, suffocated by the fumes. 
an interesting end for Bernice the Beautiful, Bernice the Seductress, Bernice the Controller of Men, Bernice the Incestuous Adulteress, But the end of all men who do not trust Christ is worse than the physical end of Bernice. There are some lessons to be learned from our text tonight. Number one, unsaved pagans will never be able to reach theological truth by legal means. Listen again. Unsaved pagans will never be able to reach theological truth by legal means. Just like the Jewish law cannot save you, neither can secular law, which many are attempting to implement to control people. Number two, unsaved pagans who hear the truth clearly articulated and Paul clearly articulates the truth. We'll get to his sermon in just a few weeks. Those who hear the clearly articulated truth are accountable even if they do not believe. You are accountable for what you hear. You are accountable for how you respond to it. And someday, when you stand before Jesus, he will ask you, why did you not act on the basis of of what you heard proclaimed from my word. Number three, those who hear and reject are subject to the most severe judgment. It is amazing that God saw fit to mention this woman in this text. You know, the New Testament writers, Luke in particular here, could have chosen to omit her name. They omitted the names of all the other high officials that were there that day, but they mentioned Bernice. Even though we don't see her participating in the discussion, she's there, she's present, she's listening, she's hearing. She says nothing, but she hears it all. Those ladies of you, you're here, you hear the word of God. You may say nothing. But what are you doing with it after you hear it? Those who hear and reject are subject to the most severe judgment. The death of Bernice, I think, is a striking warning of what hell will be like. Number four, even pagans understand that it is unreasonable to make Christian theology the basis for capital punishment but that understanding doesn't stop them from trying to do it anyway. It happens all over the world even today. Christian theology becoming the basis for getting people's heads cut off by ISIS, for example, because they refuse to reject Jesus. Number five, even the best unsaved expert can only pass the buck and not come to a fair conclusion concerning faith in Christ. Festus passes it to Agrippa. Agrippa and the council get together and they say, he want to go to Caesar? Send him to Caesar. All they can do is pass the buck. You see, they can't come to a fair conclusion concerning faith in Christ because it takes faith in Christ to understand. And if they hear and don't believe, and if you or I hear the word of God and don't believe, we are accountable. We walk by sight instead of walking by faith. You know, faith in Christ is not merely at the point of salvation, although that's where you start. Faith in Christ deals with your daily walk as well. Paul says we walk by faith not by sight. That is the Christian life. 
The Christian life is the walk of faith, where things look impossible, where the wall looks solid, and God tells you to move forward, and you argue and you say, God, it's a brick wall. I don't want to run into a brick wall. God says, move forward. And so you begin to walk by faith, even though you don't know what the future holds. It's dark out there, Lord. I know that there's a chasm somewhere up there. Walk by faith. One step at a time. That's what Paul's doing. He knows all the possible horrible outcomes of his trial. But does he deny Christ? No. He knew that God was going to put him before rulers. He'd been told that. He's before rulers, but he's going even higher to preach the gospel where more men who are in positions of authority will hear the truth and sadly will reject it. Think about our morning messages dealing with Pharaoh in Egypt. A man who heard the truth, a man who saw the power of God, a man who knew the will of God, a man who rejected the will of God and what it cost him. Is there some area of the will of God in your life that you know and you've turned your back? Some area of the will of God that you know and you are resisting it? Some area of the will of God where you have said, I will not? This morning we also mentioned Esau. He despised the blessing of God. He turned his back on what could have been his that would have resounded down through history till today. After he had done the selling of his birthright, he tried to repent, it says so in Hebrews. He sought it carefully with tears, but he was rejected. Dearly beloved, what are we losing by not moving forward in obedience to what God has revealed in his word? I don't know anything in your life. I know what faces me in my life. And so day by day I say, Lord, not my will but thine be done. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. But I believe you. I trust you. You loved me enough that Jesus died for me and I know it's true because he rose from the dead. The heart of the gospel that we started with tonight. What are you doing with what you know? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the truth of your word. Make us a people who are never ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You've entrusted us with an eternal treasure. We're only earthen vessels, but we have a treasure. We have the good news of salvation. We have that which gives men hope so that they no longer have to live in despair. A hope for the present and a hope for the future because Christ is risen from the dead. And for this we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight is hymn number 603. Let's stand to sing. We'll sing all the verses of number 603. And three.